I'm very pleased to and honored to be asked to deliver the second uh, annual president's uh, lecture and uh, really grateful for the opportunity to come up and to participate in this wonderful meeting. I had a great turnout. I talked to Wanda for quite some time this morning about uh, some of the history of this meeting and it, you really can be very, very proud of what you have developed here. And I know it's going to get stronger and stronger every single year as optometry continues to get, uh, continues to get stronger and stronger every single year around the world. I'm very uh, grateful for the opportunity to come up uh, north of the border here uh, this weekend. Uh, we, uh, down in the deep south in Alabama where I'm from, uh, we're in the midst of allergy season and uh, have all these beautiful trees and flowers. I started to take a picture of my front yard to show you this morning, but I decided against that. But at any rate, uh, but I, I was really pleased to see the sunshine up here. We have had nothing but clouds and rain all week long uh, down in Alabama. Uh, with this front coming through uh, from Texas all the way through the south. But uh, it's just gorgeous here, and I really am looking forward to the next uh, half hour, or hour and a half, uh, as I talk about one of the favorite things I love to talk about, and that's drugs. When they were, when they were asking me what could I lecture on, well, I said, I only know one thing, and that's drugs. In fact, some people think I've been in drugs so long I should be institutionalized. But I love to talk about medications and pharmacology and, and how we as optometrists can utilize our knowledge in pharmaceutical sciences and clinical medicine to take better care of our patients. And I mentioned allergies a minute ago on purpose. We're going to be talking today about inflammation and allergy. We've come a long, long way scientifically and optometrically in the last decade or two with regard to how we utilize our medications, our steroids and other medications to treat uh, all kinds of red eye conditions. Most of us in this room, I'm sure, make a living seeing patients. That's what we do, we're doctors. And so we see a lot of patients on a weekly basis, maybe even daily basis, depending on where you practice, patients who come with red eyes, swollen eyelids, itchy eyes, those kinds of things. And, sir, and there are a lot of brand new things we can talk about with regard to how to take better care of those kinds of patients. So I put together uh, about a four hour presentation this morning that uh, we'll talk about in an hour and a half on uh, how we can better take care of patients utilizing our knowledge of primarily because of the time limitation, we're really gonna limit this mainly to topical medications and uh, a little bit of orals. We'll talk about the doxycycline, the, the oral tetracyclines, how we can really utilize those in optometric practice. But this is simply my uh, disclosure uh, statement slide talking about uh, the the companies uh, with which I uh, consult or receive honoraria from or on Speakers Bureau for. Uh, <clears throat> and I love to show this cartoon from time to time in some of my lectures. We're really going to be talking to the clinician in the, in the room. The lowest common denominator. You don't have to know anything about molecular pharmacology to understand what we're going to be talking about today. I've decided really to target this to the person sitting to your left. <laughs> I figure if that person understands, we'll all understand exactly what I'm talking about. So the lowest common denominator there, person sitting to your left, kind of circular table, so figure out who's, who's to your left here today. We could talk about all of these drugs here, these drug classes, but we simply don't have time. Lots of ways to take care of inflammation and redness and itching of the eye. We're gonna be emphasizing primarily topical steroids. We'll talk about non steroidals Talk about oral tetracyclines a little bit. That's very, very important in optometric practice. Uh, we take care of patients with rosacea and meibomian gland dysfunction. And uh, sometimes we really need to pull out our oral therapy there and utilize oral tetracyclines uh, very effectively in those kinds of settings. So we'll be talking about that for a few minutes as well. But let's start out talking about the history of steroids here, this graphic graphically illustrates the timeline for various steroids over the years. You know, I've done a lot of lecturing over the years, as was mentioned, and, and uh, I've always preferred having a single slide straight ahead. I love to, like Dr. Gaddy was talking about yesterday, I love to use my laser. See, I'm using my laser here. So uh, I don't know if you can see the laser there, but I'll have to point sometimes to the right or to the left I'm not trying to ignore half of the room here, but uh, <clears throat> I would point here, but there's no slide. But uh, this graphic really illustrates over the years where we've come from with regard to steroids. And I'm dating myself because uh, very early on, we had uh, <clears throat> a steroid called Decadron. Decadron. Some of you might have used Decadron. Uh, some of you people with uh, graying hair or no hair. 
that I see around the room. Uh, but I used Decadron many years ago. That's no longer available. But you can see also, uh, <clears throat> over the years, we've had uh, Inflamase Forte, prednisolone phosphate, Pred Forte came out in the 1970s, uh, Vexol, uh, we have Flarex, FML, Lotomax, uh, Durazol, Lotomax uh, ointment. I understand you got Lotomax ointment here in Canada uh, about six months ago. Uh, a wonderful new adjunct to our steroid line of, of medications. But the graphic here illustrates a couple of things. Everything in gray, anything in a gray symbol here is a suspension. What does that mean? Got to shake it, got to shake it. And that's become exceedingly important for reasons that I'll talk to you about in just a few minutes. Very, very important. And we also have a couple of ointments. I mentioned Lotomax, we have uh, FML ointment. We have uh, one solution, Inflamase Forte or Pred Phosphate. We now use it generically, Pred Phosphate. And we have Durazol Emulsion. Durazol Emulsion requires no shaking. It's an emulsion, an oil water mixture requiring no shaking. So I'm, I'm talking here about the importance of shaking steroids. We've been using Pred Forte for many, many years and FML and other steroid suspensions. And there's been recent research on the consequences of the lack of shaking. The consequences, what if you don't shake? What if the patient doesn't shake? So let's talk about that uh, just for a moment. Let me go back and, and set the stage here for the next slide. A very well-known pediatric ophthalmologist at UCLA, Leonard Apt, years ago was interested to know to what degree do patients actually shake the bottle even when they are instructed to do so. So he recruited some patients for a research study. He gave them instructions and put in red writing, shake well before you put the drop in the eye. And he observed them across a one-way mirror to see to what extent they read the instructions and then complied with the shaking before they put the drop in the eye. Remember, the, the instructions were in red writing, shake well before you place the medication into your eye. And so he observed the patients, looked at them through a one-way mirror, and these are the results. He had 100 patients, and 60 of those, 60%, didn't shake it at all. You can see down the list here, Look over uh, here, one guy shook it 31 to 35 times. <laughs> he made sure that he shook that bottle. But all the others were in between here. But notice over half the patients didn't shake it, even though it was instructed in red writing, shake well before you put the drop in the eye. And in recent years, just in the last two to four to five years, there's been new research to show what happens if you don't shake an ophthalmic steroid. And that's very, very interesting. And I want to show you some of those results. This is a very, very recently published study comparing Lotomax gel. You'll be getting Lotomax gel, I understand, next month here in Canada. Lotomax gel requires no shaking. And uh, Pred Forte and generic Pred Acetate. So the generic of Pred Forte, 1% prednisolone acetate. And what the graphic shows here, and I'm sorry, I'm going to have to just point, point I want to point over to the right now. But uh, the 100 mark here, this is how the FDA describes how medications, how suspensions are packaged in terms of the declared concentration. If the declared concentration of a steroid is 1%, then they measure the amount of steroid in each drop, and if the amount of drop is exactly that 1% concentration, then you have 100% of the declared concentration. So the graphic illustrates if you go above 100, each drop that's coming out has more than the declared concentration. You're actually getting an overdose. If you're below the 100 line, you're actually getting an underdosage. There's less steroid than there's supposed to be. There's less than the declared concentration. So in this study, comparing Lotomax gel against Pred Forte, the trade name 1% Pred Acetate, and the generic 1% Pred Acetate, you can see that all three products were more or less on the 100 line. That's if you shake the drop. You store the bottle upright and you shake it well. So you're getting the, the declared concentration. Well, what happens if you store upright and you don't shake? You store the bottle upright, but you don't shake the bottle at all. Well, as I tell patients, the good stuff's in the bottom of the bottle, so you need to shake it up. If you store it upright and don't shake it, when you turn the bottle upside down, 
So you're getting a lot of liquid out, aren't you? So you're getting a lot of vehicle and less steroid, so you're underdosing. And you can see the graph there shows a lot of the, the uh, dosing here. And this is simulated dosing up to about uh, 16 days. You can see the initial dosing mostly underdoses the patient. You have even 25% or 50% of the declared concentration in those drops coming out early on in therapy. Now what happens if, <clears throat> oh by the way, I want to show you the only product that's still on the line there is Lotomax gel. Lotomax gel requires no shaking, and so every single drop, even without shaking, is more or less on the 100 line there. So you're getting 100% of the declared concentration with the Lotomax gel product. But with Pred Forte trade name, or generic Pred Forte, 1% acetate generic, uh, you're getting wildly varying dosing amounts of the steroid actually being delivered to the eye. Now what if you invert the bottle and don't shake? You invert the bottle, upside down storage, and you don't shake. Well, think of it. The good stuff's settling down in the tip. So when you put the drop in, you're getting an overdose initially, right? Questions? No questions. <laughs> Well, that's, it. that's an interesting question. The question is, at the end of 16 days, are you still getting positive results? We're gonna talk about, in the next slide or two, why you may get very unsatisfactory results with ocular steroids. And it has to do not just with shaking, but with a couple of other things as well. So hold the question, and if I still haven't answered it in five or 10 minutes, ask it again. And I'll still not answer it for you. <clears throat> but this particular study, in the slide you're looking at now, was Durazol compared to Pred Forte and generic 1% Pred Acetate. Durazol, a, an emulsion requiring no shaking. So you can see Durazol in the solid round there is right on the line, 100%. 100% of the declared concentration with Durazol, but with Pred Forte and the generic Pred, you're way overdosing the patient early on. Upside down storage and no shaking. So you're getting a lot of steroid in each of those initial drops. And then after a few days, you can see that the dosing goes way low. So you're underdosing the patient after uh, four or five days of therapy. And I know the, the people sitting to your right here are, are the thinkers to the, this morning. And you're thinking, who would store a bottle upside down? Some of you thinking that? No one's going to store a bottle upside down. <laughs> Ever had patients bring their medicines in like this? Happens all the time. And many of those patients keep their medicines in a bag. So yes, it is possible for a patient to store their medicine, their suspension, steroid suspension sideways or upside down. The important thing is if you don't shake, the patient will get a variable and unpredictable amount of steroid in each drop. So you're thinking, well, why don't we move away from the mandatory aspect of shaking. And that's exactly what some of the manufacturers are doing. Durazol, steroid emulsion, no shaking required. Lotomax gel, which you'll have next month here in Canada. Wonderful new product. I think you'll really like that one for a variety of reasons. No shaking is required. So <clears throat> let's talk about no shake options, no shake steroid options. One would be the generic Pred Phosphate solution, Pred Phosphate 1%. It has an anti-inflammatory efficacy close to Pred Forte, not quite there, but it's probably close enough for clinical purposes actually. So 1% Pred Phosphate, no shaking is required, and a very effective, very potent steroid, uh, sort of comparable to, to Pred Forte. Another option would be Durazol, I mentioned that, emulsion, diflupredinate, Durazol emulsion, no shaking required, we'll talk more about that in a minute. And then Lotomax gel and we'll talk more about that one as well. So we've got three good options here that we can uh, look at and capitalize upon for the treatment of, of some of our patients. Now here's the question. What if my patient, I've had this patient on a steroid for a week or 10 days or two weeks, I've had them back for follow-up and they're just not getting much better. Has that happened to you? It's happened to me, it's happened to most people. Most clinicians are gonna see patients and they've got them on a steroid, and they think, wow, the patient should be getting better by now. 
but they're just not improving to the point where I think they should be. So there's some immediate questions you should ask yourself. One would be, is the patient shaking the steroid suspension? Are they shaking the bottle? You should make it a point. Every time you prescribe a steroid or you hand a steroid sample to a patient, steroid suspension, always tell the patient, shake the bottle before you put the drop in. That's very important to emphasize for reasons you just saw. So it's very important that the patient shake the suspension or better yet, go with a non-shake steroid option like Lodamax gel that uh, we're gonna talk more about in a moment. Did you pulse dose? That's a very important question to ask yourself. As I travel around and I talk on this topic, I meet lots and lots of optometrists who either number one, never use topical steroids in their practice, or number two, if they do use topical steroids in their practice, they never use them more than QID. Is that you? You use steroids more often than four times a day? I see some people shaking yes, I see some people shaking no. So you're absolutely right. When you use a steroid, you should pulse dose. What does pulse dose mean? It means to deliberately attempt to overdose for the first day or two, and then you cut back to QID after one or two days. I write the prescription. One drop every two hours while awake times 24 hours, comma, then QID. And you're gonna see the value of that in a minute. I'm gonna show you actual data from Boston University that established the importance of pulse dosing in our optometric and ophthalmologic practices. So you really need to pulse dose. Don't tiptoe into the water with a topical steroid. Hit the patient over the head with a topical steroid. Get the patient started out correctly with a large amount of steroid so that it can bind to those steroid receptors and immediately create a nice anti-inflammatory effect for the patient. Typically, you, although the package insert will often say QID, ignore that. Start at every one hour or every two hours for the first day and then go down to QID. Your patient will get a really head start on their anti-inflammatory effect. So it's very, very crucial in the use of topical ophthalmic steroids. Uh, number three, did the pharmacist dispense generic prednisolone? You've seen the disadvantage of generic predacetate. So sometimes the patients will do that, or excuse me, pharmacists will substitute and, and put the generic in there. I'm not exactly sure how your health system works here in Canada, what the requirement for generics would be. I'm not really sure what it is in the US either, so, <laughs> to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, so, you know, we're, especially in the US, we're really going through quite some trying times uh, to iron out these bumps in the road on how medications are paid for and prescribed and so forth, but uh, that's, an, that's an issue that comes up clinically. Did the pharmacist dispense illegally fluoromethalone? This happens in our state all the time. In Alabama, pharmacists are not allowed to substitute uh, a, a different pharmacologic class. So if we prescribe Lodomax for our patient, we prescribe Predforte for our patient, the patient should not be coming back with FML, fluoromethalone. So that's a very important number two point. Number one, always stress shaking with your, stero your steroid prescriptions. Tell your patient, shake. And number two, tell your patient, bring back to your office the medicine they're getting from the pharmacy. I want to see visually exactly what the patient's using. So sometimes you're really surprised what the patient is bringing back from the pharmacy. You thought you put the patient on Pred Forte, even generic Pred, and the patient's coming back on fluoromethalone. So that's, that's one thing we didn't know about. Fluoromethalone's not nearly as potent, not nearly as effective as an anti-inflammatory, uh, as is, of course, uh, Pred Forte. Uh, does the patient have, oh, this is a good one. Does the patient have steroid-induced uveitis? Be honest with me now, I wanna ask you a question, but don't raise your hand for the answer. Got that? Person sitting to your left, you got that? Don't raise your hand when I ask you this question. How many of you have never heard of steroid-induced uveitis? I said don't raise your hand. I knew someone was gonna do that. But you were honest, you were honest. Probably 95% of the people in this room would have raised their hand. If, 
if they had raised their hand as well. But uh, most people haven't heard of steroid-induced uveitis. It is a real entity. First, well-documented in the 1970s when they were first doing steroid provocative studies. They were trying to determine when you put a patient, a healthy person on a topical steroid, to what extent does the IOP go up? Steroid provocative studies. We were learning about steroid responsiveness back in the 60s and 70s. And uh, Ted Krupen and others, University of Chicago, all did the research on that, and they identified you can have a patient with a perfectly healthy eye, put them on a topical steroid for a few weeks, and not only will the ILP go up, but you'll see cells and flare in the anterior chamber. And I've seen that myself. We've done a lot of steroid provocative studies at UAB, and I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen patients, usually African-American, but it also happens in Caucasians, uh, patients will actually be perfectly normal, put them on Predforte QID for a month, and after a month, you'll look with the slip lamp and you'll see cells and flare in the anterior chamber. That also happens after cataract surgery or when you're treating uveitis or when you're treating anything with a topical steroid. After several weeks of therapy, you can actually see that the, if you're treating uveitis, that the cell and flare just isn't getting much better after a few weeks because the steroid is egging it on. The steroid is making it last longer than it should. So in situations like that, since we know that this is a definitive condition, steroid-induced uveitis, what you need to do is start cutting back on the steroid. It sounds counterintuitive, but you wanna cut the steroid off. Begin to taper the steroid. Maybe switch to a non-steroidal. Take the patient off of your steroid and put them on a topical non-steroidal agent and you'll see that the cells and flare will, will then begin to get better. So maybe that's a pearl for you this morning, but that's a very important thing to keep in mind. Steroid-induced uveitis does occur. About 5% of blacks, a half of 1% in uh, white patients uh, will have this. The patients that I've seen have, have mostly been black uh, in some of our steroid studies. Okay, here's a good question for you. When starting steroid therapy, what dosage frequency should generally be used? TID, QID, Q1 to 2H, or D, I would prefer to use more than C if only the patient would comply. What's the answer? What is it? D? You're crazy, D? <laughs> You're absolutely right. That is the answer. I would prefer to use more than C. You want to give the patient all they will comply with. That's called pulse dosing. And that comes from Howard Leibowitz's studies, classic steroid studies, when we were first establishing the value of topical steroids and how to use topical steroids. Dr. Leibowitz, chairman of ophthalmology, Boston University, did the classic studies in the early 1980s. And basically, in a word, you want to use steroids boldly. As I mentioned earlier, don't just tiptoe into the water with a steroid. Some optometrists, if they use steroids at all, they'll use them QID, and that's it. Well, there's only one steroid I know of that, where that would be adequate, and we'll talk about that steroid in a minute. But for all other steroids, you really want to, regardless of what the package insert says, you know, when the reps come by and talk to you, they can only tell you what the package insert is, they can only tell you what the label indication is, but you and I know differently. You and I know that we, we should use medicines so that they benefit our patients in the, in the maximum way. And uh, we have learned through Dr. Leibowitz's research and others that the way to use a steroid is to pulse dose it. And let me show you his data just real quickly. This is with Pred Forte. Pred Forte. Okay, which one should I point at? You want me to point to that one or this one? Let me go over here. Okay. He used Fred Forte and he came up with a very clever way to quantify how much reduction of inflammation that you have in the cornea. So he quantified anti-inflammatory effect with different dosing frequencies of topical Fred Forte. And he said, uh, and he came up with one drop every four hours, you were able to reduce inflammation by 11%. One drop every two hours, 30%. Every hour, 51%, every 30 minutes, 61%, every 15 minutes, 68%, one drop every minute for five minutes every hour, 72%. Over what period? 
whatever it took to get it done. <laughs> Over what period of time, uh, you can see the number of drops that were put in. But there's a pattern here that I wanted you to see. It's very easy to see the pattern. The pattern is the more frequently you dose the steroid, the greater is the anti-inflammatory effect. The more frequently you dose the steroid, the greater is the anti-inflammatory effect. And that is the very basis of pulse dosing of an ophthalmic steroid. That's why you want to give the patient a drop every two hours. Every one hour is even better, but most of the time, to make it practical, we pulse dose by going one drop every two hours while awake for the first 24 hours, and then you can go down to QID. So we would much rather start our patient out with, with this kind of uh, anti-inflammatory effect here, 30 to 40, 51%, 30 to 50% reduction is much better than only a 10 or 20% reduction of the inf inflammation. So if you haven't been doing that, I really strongly encourage you to go back to your practice and change your habit there. When you're initializing steroid therapy, pulse dose it. You'll really kickstart the anti-inflammatory anti effect. Patients will come back and have a better response to therapy in a shorter period of time. So let's look at our topical steroids. Back when I first started lecturing on steroids, uh, back in the late 1970s, I took this photograph from the back cover of Archives of Ophthalmology. Back then, they were advertising Pred Forte. Pred Forte was a new steroid, and uh, Dr. Leibowitz had done his studies, comparative studies, dexamethasone, prednisolone, fluoromethylone, and they determined that Pred Forte was the king of the steroids. Pred Forte, 1% Pred Acetate, had the best anti-inflammatory effect when topically applied uh, in the various uh, animal models and human studies that, that they were doing at the time. I always regretted that I took this picture in black and white. I was trying to save some money, and so I took the picture in black and white. So I've updated the slide here, putting a color bottle of Pred Forte in there. So now it's up to date, bringing it into the 21st century. But is, Por is Pred Forte still the king of steroids? That was true up until about five years ago. And five years ago, a new steroid came on the scene, Durazol, diflupredinate. It's a ketone-based steroid, and I'll talk more in a moment about ketone versus ester. That's a big, big difference. Ketone steroid versus a, an ester-based steroid. All of our commercially available steroids, with one exception, are ketone-based. So this is a, a new ketone-based steroid, and it's emulsion, as I mentioned, emulsion, oil, water mixture, no shaking is required. So that's a nice advantage, no shaking is required here. It's also not BAK preserved, it's sorbic acid preserved, so a little bit uh, gentler, kinder uh, preservative system for patients who may be sensitive to BAK. And uh, you can see the approval here, it's antiuveitis, FDA has approved it for antiuveitis, and also pain and inflammation following uh, ophthalmic surgery. Usually that means cataract surgery, but any surgery uh, is, is game here and, and on label. Let me show you how effective this topical steroid can be. This is a patient, 63-year-old black female with cystoid macular edema following standard cataract surgery. And you know, how do we treat CME? Well, historically, we have gone with a topical steroid and a topical non-steroidal. In this particular case, it was decided to simply use this new steroid, Durazol. And I'm gonna show you, I love to show this sequence here. Uh, this is the OCT, you can see the elevation, the huge elevation of the macula. This is the fluorescein angiogram on the right, upper right. And uh, I'll show you the uh, res resolved condition in one month. Here's one month of therapy. That's before, and that's after one month. Before, and one month. I love to show that. Guess what the dosing frequency was? BID. One drop twice a day of topical Durazol for one month. It was dramatic in this particular case. And, uh, I just, and there are many, many other types of cases. Diffuse diabetic macular edema treated successfully with topical Durazol. So I'm simply indicating to you this is a very, very potent, very efficacious topical steroid and this is the study that put it on the map. Out of Harvard University, 
Stephen Foster and his group there, he's a world-renowned uveitis specialist at Harvard. He and a uh, team of, of investigators around the, uh, North America did this study and really put the drug on the map and provided data for the FDA approval of Durazol. It was a head-to-head -head comparison. Durazol used QID versus Pred Forte used Q2H. Eight times a day, Pred Forte initially versus just QID, Durazol. And then both steroids were tapered over a four-week period of time for treatment of endogenous anterior uveitis. And uh, the results simply showed that Durazol was not inferior, not inferior. In fact, most of us in the room would say, well, what does that mean? That means equivalent. <laughs> it was not inferior to, it was clinically as effective as Pred Forte used eight times a day, but Durazol only had to be used four times a day. You might have heard people say, you can use Durazol at one half the dosing frequency that you use other steroids. This is a study where that comes from. So the data for that come, are, and they're derived from this particular study, and uh, you can taper Durazol from the QID, so, but you, the basically most people, most clinicians, believe, and I do too, that you really don't need to use Durazol more than QID. So I was saying, we want to pulse dose topical steroids. This is the exception to that. You can actually start your patient out on QID Durazol, and uh, you can taper from that point, but you don't have to go any more frequently than four times a day with topical Durazol dosing. So QID dosing provides for a little bit of convenience there, of course, for our patient. Uh, there's no BAK, so it's sorbic acid preserved. No shaking, it's an emulsion. So there are lots of good advantages here to Durazol, but the downside is it is a ketone-based steroid. When you have a ketone on a steroid, it makes it very difficult for that steroid to be metabolized. It hangs around and hangs around and hangs around IOP can start to go up. In the case of a ketone steroid, cataracts can develop. There's a very nice published uh, case series just a few years ago, complications of Durazol and pediatric uveitis. Children with uveitis, chronic uveitis, treated with topical Durazol, they got some good effective resolution of the uveitis, but in so doing, a lot of these kids, 50% of them in fact, had elevated IOP, at least 10 millimeters of IOP rise in 50% of these children. Some of them had actually needed glaucoma surgery. Cataracts either formed or progressed in about 40%. So there's certainly some downside risk of all ketone-based steroids, and that is true of this new ketone steroid we call Durazol. So uh, I know you have Durazol here in Canada. I, it's been out, what, a year or two, I think? So it is available here, and you'll find it to be a very effective topical steroid. So uh, utilize it uh, with that in mind, but also keep in mind that you're gonna have potential uh, side effects. Notably, ILP elevation. ILP elevation. A lot of optometrists are fearful of steroid-induced ILP rises. And I don't know why that is, other than perhaps just lack of experience. A lot of clinicians uh, who haven't seen a lot of steroid-induced ILP rises kind of get freaked out when they see the ILP start to go up. But it's a very uh, relatively common kind of thing, and it's nothing to be feared. We'll talk a little bit about it here. The incidence is about one-third in the general population. What does that mean? That means if every single person in this room, we'll start, well, let's say we put everybody in this room on topical Pred Forte, QID, and we come back We've enjoyed this meeting so much, we come back here one month from now and measure our ILPs. We'd find that one third of us have at least three or four millimeter rise of pressure, one third of us, and maybe seven or eight, nine percent of us would have at least a 10 millimeter rise. So it's fairly, fairly common. It's fairly common to see ILP rises uh, with ketone-based steroids. Remember I'm saying ketone-based steroid. Pred Forte is ketone-based. Durazol is ketone-based. <clears throat> These are the patients who are particularly at risk. Glaucoma patients, POAG patients, primary open-angle glaucoma. 
What percentage of glaucoma patients are steroid responders, roughly? That was a question. <laughs> You're right, roughly 100%. Roughly 100%. Virtually every glaucoma patient would be expected to be a steroid responder. So if you have a glaucoma patient coming in this spring with allergies and you put them on a topical steroid, watch the ILP pretty carefully if it's a glaucoma patient. You know, watch the ILP in every single patient, but especially in glaucoma patients, uh, if a glaucoma patient's on a topical steroid for a long enough period of time, usually a few weeks, and we'll talk more about that in a moment, uh, then you may very well see the ILP go up. The first degree offspring of glaucoma patients, meaning the sons and daughters of glaucoma patients. We did a study and found that about 70% of sons and daughters of glaucoma patients are steroid responders, 70%. And also children under the age of 10, young children. You know, we see eight and 10 year olds with really bad allergies. We may put them on a topical steroid. So watch the ILP pretty carefully in, in that population. So watch it in every single patient, but especially these three groups uh, are particularly prone to have ILP elevations. Yes, sir. The question is, uh, a patient who is a steroid responder, we put them on a topical steroid, we find that their ILP goes up, is that a predictor that maybe later on in life they will develop glaucoma? Well, the answer, the short answer is no, it is not a predictor. And uh, that was the very reason why those studies were done in the 1960s and 70s. They were trying to sort that out. And there, to make a long story short, there are too many false positives and false negatives. So th there's, there's not good predictability just because your ILP goes up does not mean that you'll later on develop glaucoma. Good question. All right, so they came out, of course, in an attempt to reduce the ability of steroids to raise the ILP. They developed a couple of new products, and uh, the one I want to bring to your attention really is the one at the bottom. Uh, we have had Vexol and FML, Remexalone, Flormethalone for quite a number of years, uh, over two decades, and actually in the mid to late 90s, uh, Lodopredinol came out as well, Lodomax and Alrex, the two different concentrations. And Lodopredinol was developed specifically to reduce the risk of IOP elevations. It was developed at the University of Florida by a medicinal chemist, PhD, who was just a PhD, PhD uh, medicinal chemist, not a doctor, and I, I'm saying that for a reason, uh, in a moment, I'll, I'll tell you why I'm saying that. Uh, brilliant guy, I've met him actually, and uh, Nicholas Bodor is his name, and he developed Lodomax, Lodopredinol, by conceptualizing, if you were to take a very potent steroid like prednisolone, everyone in the room agrees that prednisolone acetate's a very, very potent, effective steroid. He conceptualized, let's take prednisolone and take the ketone out of it and insert an ester in its place. Let's take prednisolone, take the ketone out, and put an ester in its place. That would allow the esterase enzymes in our ocular tissues, a lot of esterase enzymes in the cornea and conjunctiva and uvea, that would allow these esterase enzymes to metabolize the drug. Here's the steroid, here's the steroid receptor. Steroid inserts into the receptor, you then get an anti-inflammatory effect. But you have all of the non-bound steroid hanging around. Not every molecule of steroid is bound to the steroid receptor. So the part that's bound provides the anti-inflammatory effect. The unbound steroid out here is hanging around ready to elevate IOP, ready to cause cataracts. So his concept was since we have all these esterase enzymes in the area, they can quickly metabolize the unbound steroid. So there's less steroid hanging around to elevate ILP and less steroid to cause cataracts. And that's exactly what Lodomax does. Lodomax and Alrex, this molecule Lodopredol has an ester base in it rather than a ketone. So brilliant idea. So here's how we classify our steroids today. We've got one ester-based steroid, lodopredinol, and then we have all the others that are ketones. 
You can remember all the others that are ketones. Ketone, O-N-E, ketone, prednisolone, dexamethasone, fluoromethylone, remexolone, diphenylprednisone. <laughs> so they're all ketones except for lodopredinol. Lodopredinol permits rapid metabolism, less impact on intraocular pressure, but keep in mind, the basic molecule of lodopredinol is prednisolone. So very, very potent steroid with less risk of IOP elevation and less risk of cataract formation. Some of you may remember the term soft steroid. Any of you remember that? Sometimes, uh, unfortunately, we talked the term soft steroid years ago. That's because Dr. Bodor, the PhD medicinal, medicinal chemist, was not an MD or OD or DO, and uh, he thought the term soft steroid would adequately purvey the concept here. But doctors, on the other hand, heard the term soft steroid, and we thought that meant less efficacy. We thought it meant not as good as dexamethasone or prednisolone steroids. But I'm showing you on the screen here the, a head-to-head -head study that was very recently published, head-to-head -head comparison, Lotomax compared to Pred Forte. Head-to-head -head comparison in post-cataract surgery patients. Stephen Lane at Holland did this study. Very well-respected cornea surgeons uh, in the United States. And they published this just very recently and showed that there's no difference in the outcomes here post-surgery between Lotomax and Pred Forte. These patients have rapid resolution of anterior segment cell and flare, pain. So uh, clinically, these patients do just as well. So don't think of Lotomax as a weak or less effective steroid. It's right in there with Pred Forte and dexamethasone. It's a very, very potent steroid, but it has the advantage of having less impact on IOP. We did this study a number of years ago and took a group of, a large group of patients who were known to be high steroid responders. The definition of a high steroid responder is someone who has at least a 10 millimeter rise of IOP when placed on a topical steroid, a 10 millimeter rise. And we did this in a crossover fashion. So we put patients on either Pred Forte for six weeks, QID for six weeks, or we put them on Lotomax QID for six weeks. Then we took them off steroid for a month. Then we crossed them over. So each patient at the end of the study had been on both steroids. And you can see the results here. The top line is the Pred Forte group. When these high steroid responders were placed on Pred Forte, as expected, the IOP went up a lot. When these very same patients were placed on Lotomax, you can see there was minimal rise and just a little bit of uh, elevation at the end of uh, the four to six week treatment period. So clearly, in known steroid responders, Lotomax is an excellent choice. Ed Holland, in fact, did a study. He had uh, about 30 patients, post-penetrating keratoplasty patients, corneal graft patients, who were all on Pred Forte, and they had all high IOP rises. He switched them over to Lotomax and found that the IOP came down 15 millimeters, actually, with continued uh, good immunosuppression effect, and there was no graft failure after one year after switching those patients from Pred Forte to Lotomax. So keep Lotomax in your back pocket there. It's an excellent steroid or first choice, but it can, can get you out of trouble uh, when you have some of these I IOP responders. So what do you do about it? Obviously, you want to always record the baseline IOP. Before you put a patient on any topical steroid, record in your clinical chart the baseline IOP. You want to have the patient back within two or four weeks for follow-up. You're going to check the IOP every time you see the patient, of course, for follow-up. A lot of patients don't need a steroid after, say, two weeks of therapy. Some patients need chronic steroid therapy. So every time you're seeing a steroid follow-up, uh, you want to always uh, record the IOP, of course. The greatest risk of IOP rises is in the first four to six weeks. If you have not seen a significant pressure rise in the first month or six weeks, you are unlikely to have a steroid responder. 
Got a dry eye patient, for example. We treat dry eye patients these days, and I'll talk about that in a minute, with topical steroids. We have them on steroids months at a time. So if they haven't responded with an IOP rise in the first four to six weeks, I tell those patients, well, I'll see you back in three months this time. I'll have you back in three months. You don't need to keep following these patients every two or three weeks waiting for the IOP to go up. It's probably not gonna go up at all if it hadn't gone up in the first four to six weeks. So that's a comforting thing for us if we do need to keep a patient on chronic topical steroid therapy. Yes, sir. Is that independent of dosage? Uh, the, the question is, is that independent of dosage? Uh, I wanna get to dosage in a minute because it has to do with management. Uh, typically, you're gonna see these IOP rises on QID dosing, you know, most ketone-based steroids and even with Lodomax. If you get a pressure rise on Lodomax or any steroid, it's usually with a t QID dosing or more frequent dosing. But even uh, at BID dosing, you sometimes can see that. But so let's talk about the management here. What are we gonna do about it? What if the IOP does start to go up and we're seeing these patients back for follow-up? Well, the most convenient thing to do is to stop the steroid at that point or start the taper, start to taper. And many times we're at a point in the treatment of the patient where the patient is getting much, much better and we can naturally begin to taper the steroid. So if we've got them on QID therapy, go down to BID at that point. And as Dr. Leibowitz's data at Boston University showed us, you'll get less anti-inflammatory effect. There are fewer steroid molecules around elevating the IOP, so the IOP will start to come down. In our steroid patients that, that, that we've treated, we've done a number of series of, of steroid IOP studies, and we have always found that when we stop the steroid, you know that, that curve that I showed you, the Pred Forte group, after 10 or 15 millimeter pressure rise? By the way, when we had them do the, the informed consent, crazy patients, you know, they signed off that they would allow the ILP to go up and up and up and up, which could damage their eyes, but, but they signed it anyway. You know why they signed it? They got paid. So they got paid for the study. But at any rate, uh, it's not dangerous actually. It is not dangerous at all. If the ILP goes up for a few weeks or even for a few months, it usually takes many, many months, perhaps even years, for many patients to develop damage from that. There's never been a uh, patient uh, who was carefully followed who ha has developed glaucomatous optic neuropathy in a, a steroid situation. It's only for patients who've been uh, forgotten about and they go for many, many months without follow-up with elevated ILP. So, uh, <clears throat> see, what was I, what was I, why did I bring that up anyway? <clears throat> so we, we have these patients that have the ILP elevation, and in our studies, we took them off the Pred Forte, we took them off the Lodomax, and the ILP was always back to normal within seven days. When you stop a steroid, the ILP always goes back to normal in seven days, assuming there's no further underlying inflammatory event keeping the IOP up. Of course, we have chronic uveitis patients. Sometimes it's the uveitis that's keeping the pressure up, not the steroid. But assuming there's no further inflammation or very minimal inflammation, the IOP really should go back down to normal, back down to baseline in about a week. So have these patients back one week later. If you're concerned, have them back a week later after you stop the steroid, and you should find that that IOP is, is nicely down. Another couple things you can do, but it increases the cost of therapy. You can change from a higher concentration steroid to a lower concentration, like from 1% predacetate to 1 8th percent predacetate. But you do exactly the same thing, though, by simply tapering the steroid. Reduce the dosing frequency, and that's exactly the same thing as using a lower concentration. So don't change to a lower concentration steroid. Another thing that also increases the cost of therapy because the patient has to get another prescription is to change to FML or to Lodomax. Only if you're intending to keep the patient on a long-term steroid would you want to maybe switch to FML or switch to Lodomax. Most of the time, we're simply going to begin to taper off the steroid and then with the intent of stopping it in a week or two or three, and that's all it takes only in a patient like a, a corneal transplant patient, where we know the patient's gonna need many, many more months of therapy. 
In that situation, it's worth it to maybe get them off the Pred Forte and switch to Lodomax, as Dr. Holland did in his published study of 30 cases. And in other cases, we're just not at the point where we can begin to taper off the steroid. The patient has a lot of continued inflammation. We need to keep the patient on the, the constant dose that they're on now, the dosing frequency that they're on now. So we take care of the IOP with an IOP drug. So we treat it like ocular hypertension, because it is ocular hypertension. It's steroid-induced ocular hypertension. So we put them on an anti-glaucoma medication. Beta blockers work great. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitors work great. Alpha-2 agonists like Alpha-GAN-P, that works great. So uh, the only th caveat here is you want to avoid prostaglandins. Prostaglandins may induce a little bit of inflammation there and avoid myotics. Uh, we wouldn't use myotics anyway today, but those are two categories of, of glaucoma medications we want to avoid here. But uh, it's typically uh, fairly straightforward, actually, to keep a patient on the steroid and simply to add an IOP medication for a, a week or two or three until such time that we can then begin to stop the steroid. It's really fairly straightforward. So here's our uh, lotoprednol, etabinate, LE, we sometimes call it, LE drug. Uh, we have several formulations, the, the original suspension, uh, there's ointment. I understand you got the ointment last fall. Uh, the gel is coming out uh, here in Canada and uh, next month, I understand. So that's, that's very, very imminent and you'll enjoy having that gel around. Let's talk about the gel. It is a gel in the bottle. It is thicker than a normal suspension. In fact, it's a lot thicker than the Lodomax suspension. You don't need to shake it, but I would give you a tip to simply have the patient flick it down like this. Just one little fl quick flick to get these product in the tip before they unscrew the top and then drop the, the uh, drop into the eye. So just a flick to get the product into the tip is very helpful uh, before they place the medication in the eye. Uh, <clears throat> there's no blurred vision really. There, have been, there were over 800 patients in the clinical trials for the drug and they showed that only one patient in the vehicle group actually had blurred vision. So uh, really in clinical practice, we just don't see blurred vision as an issue at all uh, for the vast majority of our patients. You specify this product, not in terms of milliliters, but in grams. And uh, we had, when this pro product first came out in the US, we had an issue where since ointments are also prescribed in grams, you know, 3.5 gram tube is a typical ophthalmic ointment product. Pharmacists were seeing grams and they were thinking we meant ointment. So they were dispensing Lodomax ointment rather than the gel. So that's one reason why you always want to have your patient bring back to your office the product they're getting at the pharmacy. Patient may be complaining bitterly of blurred vision from that steroid you prescribed to them. And they, maybe that's because they got the ointment, not the gel. So uh, <clears throat> here's a typical prescription that I would write. Lodomax gel, 0.5%. Notice the five grams there. <clears throat> five, five grams. 3.5 grams is a typical ophthalmic ointment, but this is a five gram uh, product uh, in the bottle. And uh, also, by the way, this is how I typically write a pulse dose for a steroid. So one drop Q2H while awake times 24 hours, comma, then QID. So that's not in the package insert, that would be off label, if you will, but uh, that's certainly what is in the be patient's best interest most of the time to pulse dose uh, the steroid. Notice no refills. That's very important, no refills here. Never ever give a patient a refill for a topical steroid, except in the rarest of, of exceptions. A patient that maybe you know well and they have a chronic condition and they may need a continued therapy but uh, typically you'll give them enough, they'll come back for the follow-up. You'll be following these patients anyway, and when they come back for follow-up, you can then authorize them the next prescription at that point. Let's look at steroids and cataract just very briefly. <clears throat> As you know, cataract formation with steroids, the cataracts are always, always, always posterior subcapsular. They are never anterior subcapsular, they're never nuclear, they're never cortical. They're posterior subcapsular opacities. 
great example here. Here's the visual axis. 2025 visual acuity, but a whopping honking cataract there when you bother to dilate the pupil. So always dilate pupils periodically of patients on chronic steroids. Now, if you've got a patient on a topical steroid for a few weeks or even a few months, that's not going to cause cataract. In fact, let me just go ahead and give the pearl here. Lotomax won't cause cataracts. Lotomax will not cause cataracts. All the other ketone-based steroids can cause cataracts if used chronically, but topical Lotomax doesn't, and here's why. Now, I'm trying to make this as simple as possible for the person sitting to your left, but I'm not going to get into a lot of chemistry here. Basically, what this slide says is that you have a ketone group of the steroid. Here's the ketone group. Let me point it out over here for you folks over here. There's the ketone group right there. There's the steroid, the ketone-based steroid. There's the ketone group. The ketone interacts with the lens protein to cause what's called a shift-base intermediate, which creates a, a Haynes rearrangement, which causes the opacity, the cataract. But guess what? It requires a ketone group to do that. You've got to have a ketone in the steroid. Lotomax doesn't have a ketone group. So it is a true fact, what I'm about to tell you is true, not that what I've said up to, point isn't, it, up to this point isn't, <laughs> but Lotomax has never been documented to cause cataracts. There's never been a report to Bosch and Loam. There's never been a report to FDA. There's never been a published scientific or clinical report of a Lotomax-induced cataract. And this is the reason. It doesn't have a ketone in it. So, uh, that's one other reason why you'll really enjoy Lotomax gel, no shaking required, and you also have very little, if any possibility, even in long-term use of topical lotoprednol in inducing a cataract formation. Cataracts really come more from non-ocular steroids, systemic steroids, like prednisone, oral prednisone, inhaled steroids for asthma. Chronic inhaled steroids can cause cataracts, Intranasal steroids, however, do not cause cataracts. Intranasal steroids. You have nasal cord here in Canada? Nasal cord? Flonase? So those steroids don't cause cataracts. In fact, in the U.S., they're not OTC. They're over the counter. Are they here in Canada yet? But it's probably coming, though. So nasal cord and flonase, intranasal steroids. I'm going to talk about that in a minute, actually, uh, whether we should even recommend those as optometrists. And uh, you may be surprised in the answer. So, uh, I've already said this. Lotomax does not cause cataracts. So, fundamental steroid guidelines here. Choose your steroid carefully. If you have a patient where IOP is not a concern, you know that this patient's not a steroid responder, or it's a short-term utilization, Pred Forte is great, Durazol is great, Lotomax is great as a first-line steroid. For long-term care or if IOP is a concern, you've got a known steroid responder, you have a glaucoma patient, for example, who comes in with anterior uveitis. This patient's going to require topical steroid. So you can bet that that IOP is going to go up if you use a topical steroid in your glaucoma patient with uveitis. So that's a great patient to use your lotopredinol products. Lotopre LE stands for lotopredinol etabinate. So the Lotomax half percent, Aurex 0.2 percent, FML, Vexol, all of these medications are known to have less risk of IOP elevation. Pulse dose, always, always, always pulse dose unless you're using Durazol. Pulse dose unless you're using Durazol. Durazol really doesn't require a pulse dose. You can go ahead and start it out, QID. Monitor the IOP carefully in the first month. That's when you're likely to see the IOP go up, if it's going to go up at all. No refills. Use the shortest effective dose, of course, and length of therapy. And uh, avoid, if, of course, if you have uh, epithelial herpes simplex, mycobacterial infection. Let's talk about some new things here. Steroids and microbial keratitis. 
Every image you see here on the screen is a patient with microbial keratitis, a bacterial corneal ulcer. And uh, we don't have time this morning to really talk about the differential between infiltrative keratitis, which is sterile, and infectious keratitis caused from bacteria. But uh, these are good, good cases here of microbial keratitis. Uh, published in 2012 was the now infamous SCUD study, Steroids for Corneal Ulcers trial. And uh, they had a very large number of patients that were collected through a multicenter study around the world. Many of these patients were from India. Uh, a number of them were from North America. And uh, the study was done to try to conclude whether or not we should or should not be using topical steroids in conjunction with our antibiotic therapy in treating patients with infectious keratitis. And the conclusion here from the study was <clears throat> this initial study published in 2012 looked at the three month results. After three months of therapy, what was the best corrected visual acuity? So they used best corrected acuity as the endpoint here, and they found that uh, there was no overall difference in the best corrected acuity in the steroid group versus the group that just got the antibiotic uh, alone. And uh, they concluded that uh, th there really wasn't much difference except in patients who, who had very central initial lesions that reduced the visual acuity. They found that patients that had initial acuity loss tended to be better than patients who did not have centrally located uh, lesions. But uh, there's some new updates. Over the next ensuing years, they followed up these patients. They now have four-year data. They looked at these patients now at four years after their initial treatment. And they did some publish publications last year. I've got them at the bottom of the screen here. If you can look at your handout later on if you want the details. But uh, they did some hedging here. The authors did some hedging as they reported their results. Adjunctive topical steroid therapy may be associated with improved long-term clinical outcomes. Uh, there may be a benefit to using steroids early in the first two or three days. You put your patient on an antibiotic, and then after two or three days, that's when you start the steroid. So the authors were concluded there may be some benefit there long-term. But then some other uh, analyses, also published just in the last few months actually, have shown us that after controlling for visual acuity at enrollment, so after taking into account these patients that had central ulcers and reduced acuity on initial presentation before the therapy was started, after controlling for the visual acuity enrollment, the best corrected acuity was not significantly different between the steroid and the placebo groups at four years. And there was a large Cochrane uh, systematic database study. Uh, these Cochrane systematic studies are really the end all to look at a very comprehensive review of the literature to conclude where do we stand now on standard of care on a certain clinical topic. So there was a very recently published uh, Cochrane Systematic Review. I have that listed also at the bottom of the slide if you want to look at that later. And I'm quoting from it here in the, in the last bullet. There is inadequate evidence as to the effectiveness and safety of adjunctive topical steroids compared with no topical steroids in improving visual acuity, infiltrate, scar size, or adverse events among participants with bacterial keratitis. So basically, after all of this, the conclusion is that uh, we are no better off now with our knowledge, except that there is no reason to rush into steroids in conjunction with our antibiotic and there's no reason to avoid steroids. So there's neither a benefit <clears throat> nor <clears throat> a downside risk there in using steroids. So I think most optometrists at the primary care level, you know, we're not typically going to treat independently. The really large central ulcers, we're gonna be stick usually with the smaller or more peripheral ulcers. So for us in clinical practice, I think most optometrists would probably steer clear of topical steroids. <clears throat> and I don't think there's going to be a major disadvantage at all uh, if we do that uh, according to uh, the data derived from this particular study. <clears throat> Let's look at GPC for a moment. Excuse me. <clears throat> Back in the 1980s, 
early 90s, I had the opportunity to lecture with Matea Allen Smith. Matea Allen Smith was a world-renowned ophthalmologist, ocular immunologist at Harvard, who worked together with Don Korb in Boston to define GPC. She and Don Korb named GPC, GPC. So she was an <coughs> obvious authority in the area. And she would always say from the podium, just like this, steroids do not work for GPC. Steroids do not work for GPC. And then about 1990, I got a call from a startup drug company in uh, Key West, Florida. And they were working on a new product called Lodopredinol. And they were interested to know if this new ester-based steroid, because of its lipid solubility, might be effective in GPC. It might demonstrate the anti-inflammatory efficacy of this new steroid. So we enrolled a number of, of patients at that time and uh, expanded our study to nationwide multicenter clinical trial on GPC patients, giant papillary conjunctivitis. You see them here, some examples. And we're seeing a resurgence of GPC today. You know, we were seeing a lot of GPC in the 80s, early 90s, kind of went away for a while. Now it's come back with our silicone hydrogel materials. So we do see a good bit of GPC uh, in our clinical practices. So we did some studies. <clears throat> Here's the results of one of the large studies that we did. We did a placebo controlled trial. The FDA said, in order to really make this scientific, you've got to keep the patients in these dirty contact lenses causing the GPC. Because if you take the dirty contact lenses away, that's a treatment for GPC in and of itself. So keep the patients in the dirty contacts, use a steroid QID on top of the contact lenses, or placebo, either placebo or steroid, along with these dirty contact lenses. So here's the results. You can see <clears throat> the lodopredinol and the placebo group. We had 221 patients on Lodomax suspension, 222 on placebo, and this is complete response to therapy here. The 76% uh, had complete resolution of papillae after four weeks of treatment, QID, for four weeks, we had 76% had complete resolution of the papillary response. 51% in the placebo group had a complete resolution. Itching, 94% had complete relief of itching in the lodopredinol group. 79% in the placebo group. Lens intolerance, 91%. Complete lens uh, <coughs> intolerance uh, relief in the uh, LE group and 78% uh, in the placebo group. And the p-values at the bottom there indicate the statistical significance there. So this was statistically significant in favor of the Lodomax. But you're sitting out there thinking, wow, look how good the placebo was. <laughs> right? Placebo was doggone good. The placebo was just the vehicle, like an artificial tear. And I bring this up because many of you in this room are currently treating GPC with antihistamine mast cell stabilizers. You know, your anti-allergy drugs, you're using artificial tears. You might be using a ketone-based steroid. But I'm here to tell you the only confirmed, documented, effective treatment for GPC is Lodomax. And this is proof. There are no other studies that I know of that show that any other steroid works. Dr. Allen Smith said herself, steroids don't work for GPC in the 1980s. But uh, this is one study published in the literature. There are two or three other large-scale studies showing Lodomax does work. It's my treatment of first choice for GPC. Obviously, today, we have the patient remove their lenses. That's even better. You know, take your lenses off, discontinue contact lens wear, are your patients like mine, eight Dr. Myopes and no backup glasses? Does that happen here in Canada? I thought it just happened in Alabama. So if you can, you know, have them go without their contact lenses. If it's a mild case, a week may be perfectly sufficient. Go without your contacts for a week and pulse dose your Lodomax and then go down to QID and QID for a week is very, very effective. It'll, it'll completely resolve those papillae, take care of the itching, 
patients then can, then can then resume their contact lens wear. Sometimes if it's a raunchy case, a really bad case, it may take a month. So you tell the patient right up front, you're gonna have to go without your contacts for probably a month until we can get this cleared up. But I, I'm just really trying to tell you that Lodomax is the way to go. I've had many, many successes with Lodomax and uh, you don't need to use anything else. You, know, you can put them on a daily disposable. If they just don't have backup glasses, put them on a daily disposable. Uh, you really don't want to use the Lodomax on the lens though. Uh, put the first drop in in the morning, wait 10 or 15 minutes, then they can put their lenses in. At noon, uh, they really should take out the lens. If it's daily disposable, they can put the drops right on the lens, uh, off label, but uh, we really prefer that they take the lenses out then put the drop in after 10 or 15 minutes, put the lenses back in. So they can go that, that route. Uh, no other classes of drugs are needed. You don't need an antihistamine mast cell stabilizer, artificial tear, decongestant, anything else. Lodomax is really the only thing that you need to do. But then, of course, you have to educate your patient on uh, what has caused this, you know, the dirty contact lenses, the exposure to the uh, antigens. So these patients need to cut back on their wearing time, enhance their lens hygiene, those kinds of things, and otherwise you'll see these patients back in the office. Let's look at dry eye for a quick moment. As you know, in the last decade, we have learned that a, an important component of dry eye today is inflammation. We have an inflamed ocular surface, and uh, this inflamed ocular surface with those inflammatory cytokines, they're disrupting the normal arc reflex system back to the brain that tells the brain that the ocular surface is dry. So these inflammatory mediators are blocking this normal reflex mechanism here that would tell the brain that the eye is dry and that reflects to the lacrimal gland to secrete more tears. So it's a vicious cycle here and as time goes on, as you know, uh, the natural history of dry eye is that it will typically get worse over time. It's a chronic progressive condition unless we intervene at some level to stop the inflammation, this is going to get better over time. Excuse me, it's going to get worse over time. I know you have uh, in your office a roster of patients. I love to go in in the morning before I see patients and see who's going to come in. Don't you do that? You know, optometry becomes a family. Our patients become a family after you see patients for a number of years. And you're looking down your list for that day and your name, uh, your uh, eyes get glued to a name on there and you're thinking of her, and you're thinking, oh no, what can I do this time? I haven't done the last three visits. You know exactly what she's gonna be complaining about. Get ready now at eight o'clock in the morning for that 2.30 appointment this afternoon. So you're shivering in your boots, you know, wondering what are we gonna do different? Because you know she's got this ocular surface, this keratitis, and you just haven't been able to get rid of it. That's because you haven't started steroids. Steroids have become the mainstay of therapy for moderate to severe dry eye, especially when there's significant ocular surface disease like you see here. So you've got lots of keratitis here, superficial punctate keratitis, along with symptoms and maybe redness of the eye. You've got inflammation here, ocular surface inflammation. And Steve Flugfelder, Baylor University, about a decade ago, documented the efficacy of topical steroids. Uh, they used Lodomax, actually, an ester-based steroid because chronic dry eye is chronic by definition. Steroids may be, need to be used for a longer period of time. So the ester-based steroid provides for safer therapy with a topical steroid. And he did a placebo-controlled study, artificial tears versus Lodomax over a period of a month and found that patients on the Lodomax were significantly better in signs and symptoms after two or four weeks of topical therapy. I have in my practice what I call the smile factor. The degree to which a moderate to severe dry eye patient comes back to see you with a smile on their face. How often does that happen? You know, these patients are miserable. And if they've never been on a steroid, you know, you've used artificial tears, you've used omega-3s, you've used punctal plugs. If you haven't used steroids, I really want to encourage you to go back to your office and start using topical Lodomax for your patients. Patients will come back significantly improved 
in the first two to four weeks. I think a good follow-up interval is actually, uh, you can do it as short as two weeks. One month is even better, but uh, two to four weeks on the follow-up is a good thing to do. In, in Dr. Flugfeller's study, they found no IOP elevations. I've had a rare patient on Lodomax with an IOP spike. You certainly can see that with Lodomax, but it's, it's fairly rare. And uh, usually with a dry eye patient, if you see an IOP spike after a few weeks, that's at the point where you can start to taper off the steroid anyway. So these are really safe patients to use topical steroids on. Here's the recommended paradigm today in using topical steroids, uh, specifically Lodomax for treatment of dry eye. So put them on uh, QID therapy, Lodomax QID, along with the patient's artificial tear. And at the end of about a two week period of time, go down to BID on that. You can go down to BID, and that's when you can start the restasis. Dr. Flugfeller, Dr. John Shepard, and others have shown that when you use a steroid two or three weeks before restasis, there's far less stinging with restasis. Stinging is the number one reason to discontinue restasis. So that you'll get far less stinging with restasis and a lower dropout rate with restasis when you proceed with a steroid. So there are several advantages here. And then after you go uh, for several more weeks there on the BID Lodomax and the BID Restasis, you can stop the Lodomax and just use it for flare-ups. After several months, if the patient has a resurgence of their signs or symptoms, put them on the Lodomax QID for a week or two, and then you can stop it again. I've had a number of patients come back and say, Dr. Bartlett, could I just stop my Restasis and stay on the Lodomax? I said, sure, let's do that. So I have some patients who will go one drop a day of Lodomax, just one drop a day, low dose maintenance therapy. It maintains their signs and symptoms, IOP stays controlled, no cataracts, and they can go for months and months and months on that. So you just want to tailor it, of course, to the needs of your patient. Uh, Restasis, as far as uh, safety, is actually a safer medication long term compared to any steroid. <laughs> You never get any cataracts or any IOP elevations on restasis. But uh, the issue sometimes can be burning and stinging with the restasis. But by uh, initiating the steroid first, that will often uh, accelerate the acceptance rate for the topical restasis. Let's look at, uh, I think we only have about five more minutes to go here. Uh, <clears throat> what should we do in five minutes? Uh, yeah, let me ask a question. Uh, I answer a question. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, Omega-3 fish oils, those are excellent. Uh, absolutely. You can combine that. You can actually use it as first-line therapy. So even for milder patients with dry eyes, fish oil, omega-3s, you know, 2,000 milligrams a day at breakfast with a meal is a great way to go with any dry eye patient. Absolutely. Uh, Let's, let's end with this one here, oral tet tetracyclines. You guys use oral tetracyclines here? All right, great, let's, let's end on this topic. Tetracyclines for my bombing gland dysfunction and rosacea. We really like to use doxycycline today. Once or twice a day therapy, longer acting, very well tolerated, especially in low dose. Here's a very classic patient with rosacea. Papules, pustules, macules, so the dermatologic manifestations are classic here. Sometimes it's fairly subtle, but uh, is it possible to have ocular rosacea without dermatologic rosacea? Is it possible to have diabetic retinopathy <clears throat> in a patient who doesn't have diabetes? No. So, you're not gonna have ocular rosacea unless there, is, there are dermatologic manifestations of dermatologic rosacea. Ocular rosacea is a component of dermatologic rosacea. Now the dermatologic lesions could be very, very subtle, but they will be there if you look. So in Alabama, what we can do is, our law permits us to treat ocular rosacea. Now if a patient comes in looking like this and the eyes are perfectly fine, there are no signs and symptoms of ocular surface disease. There's no dryness. There's no myobalming gland dysfunction. I will not treat this patient. I'll send this patient to the dermatologist. 
But if this patient has eye findings, eye signs and symptoms, along with the dermatologic features here, I will put that patient on oral doxycycline and will not send them to the dermatologist. This is a patient that we can handle optometrically and as we treat the eye, the skin will get better too. So that, <clears throat> that's a double uh, benefit for our patient. Here's another patient. You can see here over on the edge of the lid, these inspissated meibomian glands, these meibomian caps. This is a patient with advanced meibomian gland dysfunction. So <clears throat> for both rosacea and meibomian gland disease, and some patients with rosacea also have MGD, Low-dose doxycycline is excellent. You can do all the other things first, hot compresses, massage, lid hygiene, lid scrubs, those kinds of things are helpful, but ultimately it really benefits these patients the best by going with oral doxycycline. <clears throat> We're not using the doxycycline as an antibacterial. We're using low-dose doxycycline as an anti-inflammatory drug. The benefit? has to do with anti-lipase activity, also MMP9 inhibition. So these inflammatory mediators are causing a lot of ocular surface disease here and irritation and redness. And these patients placed on low dose oral doxycycline will have usually fairly rapid improvement. Here's a good case. <clears throat> One of my patients, she has a subtle, I don't know if you can see it or not, there's a papule <clears throat> on her cheek. So there's a papule here. So she does have known rosacea. Her eyes are red, ocular surface irritation. They are dry. She has telangiectatic vessels on the eyelids. Lots of vessels here bilaterally. So she is miserable. She is absolutely miserable with her ocular rosacea. I put her on 50 milligrams twice a day of oral doxycycline, 50 milligrams BID for a month. I typically like to have these patients back in one month put them on the doxycycline, have the patient back in one month. And here she is after one month of follow-up, you can see clearly there that uh, she's had substantial improvement. The lids are looking better, the conjunctiva is looking better. Uh, she even looks like a happier patient here after one month. So oral doxycycline, 50 milligrams. <clears throat> you can, after that one month follow-up, if the patient has that sort of improvement, I then will tell the patient, go down to 50 milligrams once a day. Instead of 50 milligrams twice a day, let's just go down to 50 milligrams once a day and have them back in one more month. If they're doing well or even better at that point, I go down to 50 milligrams every other day. 50 milligrams every other day. So you can keep titrating it down very, very low until you find a dosage that maintains the patient comfortably. Now, other doctors, instead of simply taking the 50 milligram and titrating that low, they'll use what's called periostat. Periostat is 20 milligram dose, very, very low dose, 20 milligrams, but it's terribly expensive, terribly expensive. So I don't go that route. I would rather go with the, the generic 50 milligrams, doxycycline, very inexpensive, and just start them out one tablet twice a day, and then go down to once a day, and then every other day, whatever it takes to control their, their signs and symptoms. So here's a typical way I write the initial prescription. 50 milligrams doxycycline, 60 of them, because it's to use twice a day, so that's a one month supply. 60 of them for a one month supply, take by mouth. Always put PO in your prescription. You may have uh, EHR you're using, but always indicate that by mouth, twice a day for ocular rosacea. I give them about three refills. And in terms of side effects, these side effects are very well known except for the last bullet. And I really want to emphasize that for you here before we, we go to lunch or, or wherever we're going next. <laughs> uh, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. A nausea is not uncommon. You can give it with food. It, it makes it a little bit more palatable uh, when it's taken with a meal or, or a, a little snack. Tooth discoloration, bone deformity, that's why we never ever use it in children. We never ever use it in the pregnant female. So it is an absolute no-no for use during pregnancy. Always ask that question. If you've got a uh, 30 or 40 something female with rosacea, uh, always ask uh, if they are pregnant or intending to get pregnant. Photosensitization, uh, that's why we really wanna keep the doses low. 
So you're more susceptible to sunburn. Uh, you may want to wear a hat outdoors, use sunscreen. <laughs> but the very last thing here uh, was unknown to me uh, until about 20 years ago. I had a patient, I put on doxycycline for rosacea, and she came back with esophagitis. And I was uh, talking to a, a a couple of other speakers uh, many years ago about this, those of us who speak on this sort of thing, and we start, looked into the literature and found that actually there's a recommendation. When you're taking oral doxycycline, don't take the medication within an hour of bedtime. You wanna, have, you wanna stay upright for at least an hour after you take your dose, because when you lie down, there's some reflux that you can get into the esophagus, and that can cause inflammation of the esophagus. And I had a, one of my patients develop this. There's a very well-known speaker in optometry who lectures on this very thing, and she had this herself. And she's a pharmacist, should have known better. But uh, this is a very well-known phenomenon, and many pharmacists will put a sticker on a bottle now. When the pharmacist dispenses this, they'll put a sticker on there, do not lie down within an hour after taking the medication. So remind your patient to uh, don't take this within an hour of, of bedtime. So that's it for our time this morning. Thank you so much for your very careful attention.